Good evening. Thank you for joining us in our Unplugged Bible Study. We are in the book of Jonah. We have been marching through the minor prophets. Uh, we call them minor prophets, not because they're of lesser importance, but because the books are a whole lot shorter. In fact, uh, we just finished uh, just a few weeks ago, Obadiah. It was only one chapter, one chapter. But today we're in Jonah chapter 3. So if you have a Bibles, reach for them, opening to Jonah chapter 3. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for this study tonight. Pray that your blessing would rest upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's look at verse 1 of Jonah, the third chapter. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Now, when we left Jonah at the end of chapter 2, we had just uh, seen him being vomited back on the beach. Now, this chapter is about the restored Jonah following God's original plan for his life and preaching to those in Nineveh, the Ninevites. God was determined to do the work through Jonas, so he didn't give the reluctant prophet, uh, he didn't just mark him off. One of the great lessons of Jonah's failure and forgiveness is that God can continue to use those who return to him. Now, thankfully, we serve the God of the second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance. I'm just thankful that God is long-suffering. He has been in my life. I'm sure that he has in yours also. Just like Jonah, many spiritual leaders received a second chance to do what God called them to do. Adam sinned in the garden, and God covered him. Moses murdered a man, and God called him. Elijah quit and complained. Then God recommissioned him. Peter denied the Lord, and then God used him at Pentecost. John Mark deserted the mission team at Pamphylia, yet God moved upon him to write the second gospel. And uh, that has been the story of the church through the ages. We've all received a multitude of opportunities to return and serve God. And once God corrected his reluctant prophet, he continued the work he intended. Now, I'm of the opinion that Jonah could more effectively preach the message of repentance because he knew his own need to repent. Being a repentant sinner didn't disqualify Jonah from preaching repentance. It made his preaching all the more effective. John's third chapter reminds us that authentic revival impacts both the individual and the culture. Let's look at the next two verses. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message of judgment I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command, went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now God told Jonah, go and preach the message that I tell you. While spiritual renewal may occur without a preacher or a prophet, it never occurs without the word, without divine truth. And here Jonah declared the word of God. Interestingly, the prophet didn't sugarcoat the truth out of fear of offending the audience. He didn't go woke. He didn't try to gain their favor or tremble at their threats. He simply preached the message that God gave him. I ask you the question, how are we to speak or proclaim the word of God? I, I want to give you several references how we are to share the Word of God. Number one, we are to speak truth in love. Turn back in the uh, New Testament to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. In fact, let's start at verse 14. Then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like truth. Instead, we will hold to the truth in love, becoming more and more in every way like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Under his direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other part grows, except that the whole body is healthy and growing, and it is full of love. Now, while we might question Jonah's motives based on the last chapter of this book, he was a little upset because God really did uh, allow them to repent, declaring the message of God's pending judgment. It, it reminds me of someone who, 
I was, I was sitting down and talking to, and they had gone through a very, very difficult divorce, very, very difficult divorce. And the thing that bugged the person the most was this, you know, it was a terrible time that I just went through. But the thing that I really am upset about is that they're going to ask God to forgive them, and He will, and He will. You see, we need to offer the truth to all people. He declared the truth to the commoners in the street, also the leaders in the palace. God's offer of grace extends to all races and all places. I want to say that, to all races and all places. This, of course, reminds us of our commission to go into the entire world. We see that in Matthew 28 and preach the gospel. And then we obey the truth wholeheartedly. Jonah's message was not a dissertation on the possibility and probability that God could or would destroy the city of Nineveh. When we declare the truth, we do more than simply inform. Instead, we call for radical obedience to the truth of God. It really didn't matter if Jonah's heart was fully committed to God's message. It doesn't matter if Jonah uses all the correct evangelistic tools and techniques. What's really important is delivering God's message to the right people in the right place at the right time. God will achieve what God wills. We just have to be prepared to do our part. It's really reassuring that it doesn't depend on us anyway, for we're partners with God, and the Holy Spirit does the work. Then let's look at verses 5 and 6 as we see a sudden work of God on an unexpected people. It says, The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least they decided to go without water and wear sackcloth to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard that Jonah was saying this, he stepped down from his throne, took off his royal robes, he dressed himself in sackcloth and sat on the heap of ashes. There was a remarkable turnaround. The Assyrians responded to the message with genuine repentance. To say it differently, they believed the word of God and then behaved in a consistent manner with the truth. See, it's not just a matter of of just assenting or saying we believe. There has to be a transformation in our lives. In fact, verse 10 indicates that when God saw their actions, He forgave them, withheld His judgment. Now, what are the characteristics of genuine spiritual renewal or revival? Jonah went to preach with unquestioned obedience, but we might ask, why them? Why them? Why then? The people of Nineveh, they weren't even praying for revival. They didn't even seem to be interested. To a degree, Jonah has a point. The Assyrians qualified better as candidates for God's sovereign judgment than as candidates for God's sovereign grace. But Jonah's successful preaching campaign had nothing to do with Jonah's ability or the Assyrians' worthiness. All we say for sure is that God had a purpose beyond human understanding. If we take John 3.16 seriously, then we must conclude that before God showered Nineveh with grace, He reached to them with love. Perhaps we can look at God's choice to save the Assyrians differently. Maybe this represented God's plan to produce more good in the world by saving the worst people in the world. No doubt their pillaging stopped for at least a short time. In the end, the revival of Nineveh is nothing short of a sovereign work of forgiveness that produced change. This revival was totally unexpected, and initially it was undesirable. Consider the probability that this brutal king would suddenly repent, turn to God. For that matter, why did they even listen to Jonah? Some commentators have suggested that the gastric juices of the fish bleached Jonah's skin. But we can't qualify anything about his appearance. It wasn't his appearance that changed them. It was the power of God. Whatever caught their attention, We need to realize that when we speak to God's people, we aren't preaching at them as if we're up here and they're down there. We're telling them what they need to do based on what we've already seen in our own lives. Paul the Apostle had a similar experience with God. While traveling to Damascus to imprison Christians, the hostile enemy of Christ, Paul, suddenly and unexpectedly encountered God. And that confrontation resulted in a radical change in his life. 
This truth brings hope to all those parents, all of those parents that plead with their wayward children to return to God, and to all those pastors that plead with their indifferent congregation to return to God. God has and can move suddenly on those that don't even expect to hear from Him. Verses 7 through 9, Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city, No one, not even the animals, might eat or drink anything at all. Everyone is required to wear sackcloth and pray earnestly. Everyone must turn from their evil ways, stop their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will have pity on us and hold back His fierce anger from destroying us. Notice the transformation of the entire culture. Only God can produce that radical change. Remember that when God regenerates the soul, outward manifestations of holiness should follow. The convert that feels comfortable in their formal rebellion. Listen, have they really truly repented in the first place? Look at verse 10 as we conclude. When God saw that they had put a stop to their evil ways, he had mercy on them and didn't carry out the destruction he had threatened. When God's people experienced revival, as in the case of Jonah, lost people that completely ignore God came to him in repentance. To say it differently, God must do something to us before he can do anything through us. Notice two key terms here, saving and undeserving. God relented or spared the Assyrians from destruction. Of course, this pictures God's grace because the people did not deserve his mercy. Uh, We should be careful to remember that no one deserves mercy. But from a human perspective, if anyone lacked moral decency and deserved wrath, they did. It's easy for those in the church to cast stones, to cast stones from behind our mortar, brick, and wooden walls at sinners. But will that type of preaching or evangelism ever make a difference in our world? Probably not. The message of repentance, however, can change hearts. If we in the church hope to impact our world for good, we must declare the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Nehemiah records one of the greatest revivals in history. In the eighth chapter, Ezra the prophet read the word of God for six hours from early morning until noon, and unexpectedly the people began to weep. What did Ezra and Nehemiah instruct them to do in response to God's moving? They told the people to do two things. Number one, honor God in His holiness. And number two, share God's blessings with their neighbors. But we must not forget that revival doesn't come to Israelites until renewal and commitment. It came the same way to Nehemiah, and it will come that way to us. We need to honor God And then we need to share this word with others. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for the study tonight. I pray that it will have lasting effects upon people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you for listening to that message. If you responded or if you have any questions, you can go to www tlfchurch.com slash connect. Leave your contact information and your message. Hit submit and we'll have one of our church staff reach out to you. Remember, you can give online through our website or you can send in your tithes and offerings by mail. You can find all the info on how to do that by going to www.tlfchurch.com slash online dash giving. Thank you so much for your continual support during this time. On Wednesday nights, we have our midweek unplugged Bible study at 7 p.m. in which a new devotional will be posted on our website. We thank you for joining us online today. We hope that you are blessed, encouraged, and challenged through that message. Hit like, subscribe, feel free to share this video with others. We love you. We thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again next time. God bless.